We are here December the 15th. There's a chance that one or two of you are here for the first time. Scanning the participant list, and there's no way that I saw everybody. We have a lot of regulars who have joined us over the year, as Craig said. So we're delighted to have you back and join us again. As you well know, <clears throat> before we start any of our conversations, we take a moment to acknowledge and recognize where we're meeting. And for Craig and I, that is... Well, we're not at the state campus, but we are in Calgary and the holidays are rapidly approaching. Just to bring a little bit of notice to the winter solstice, December the 21st is the shortest day of the year. And in Indigenous culture especially, but across other cultures too, it's a very, very important day. And our um, traditional territories here, the Blackfoot Confederacy, recognize it as the returning of the sun. And so it's a deep time of reflection and then preparing as each of the days get longer. Many of us will be celebrating other holidays as well. There are actually 14 that happen in December. So whatever it is for you, we will be wishing you a happy holiday from Sate. For here right now, we'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And that includes our indigenous people from the Siksika, the Pekani, the Ghani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda, and the Northwest Métis homeland. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. I had no idea you were such a poet. Notice of the winter solstice. Went ah, very well done. I'm not. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I can't wait. Um, I can't wait for that to happen because the days will start getting longer again. Psychologically, it's very cool for me. Yes. Anyway, looking to 2024, Jenny. Um, what do leaders need to know? Why don't we start there? That's what we titled this. So we did. Why don't we talk? Yeah. So we're gonna look forwards before we look backwards. My that works. Yep. Um, so what do what do we think? We did, in fact, in line with gift to giving, we did some sessions recently, very fun sessions where we looked at what have we learned or what have I learned actually from the contact with leaders. We did a little tally. I think there's about mm, seventeen hundred, just over seventeen hundred people that I've come into contact with this year and probably about 1200 of them are leaders that's first time contact often we see people two or three times so building off the insights of what we've learned this year I think our biggest conversations next year will be around getting feedback you've all those of you who are regulars who've heard me call it feed forward I'm not going to let go of that just yet uh, but getting it right and we don't get it right at the moment I think that's the biggest one talking of power skills like if you have the power to offer really good feedback. And in that comes the ability to listen properly. We often get asked to talk about feedback, but not to talk about listening. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest one. And then failure. There's some really good new information, new language coming out, primarily from Amy Edmondson at the moment, but it's like a tap. The minute that starts, we'll get much better language anatomy around what is failure we've thrown around for a couple of years now fail fast fail forwards um fail gracefully <laughs> any which way you can fail but with no help and so now to be able to put a structure around that that's got to be great for leaders and one of the things i love that's come out of there straight away is what is blameworthy and what is praiseworthy and we actually have a continuum that we can help leaders to work to now there's very little that is blameworthy that changes the conversation and then the one I keep sticking to that we're rubbish at is boundaries. And I don't mean, well, maybe we are rubbish, but generally as a society, we've not, we've lost track of boundaries and that's an important one. Those would be my three for 2024. It's three. Okay. I'm trying to... <laughs> you asked, I answered. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, sorry. So you were already going to go a direction I wasn't planning on going here, but blameworthy and praiseworthy. Mm-hmm. What a great place to start this continuum here. Right? Can you can you double click on that a little bit more? Because as usual, you've thrown something out right off the bat that has caught my attention. So, so it's it's straight from <clears throat> Amy Edmondson's new book. Let's go there for now. But you people who are listening here, if you Google her, look her up on YouTube, go right to the book. There's lots of information coming out on this. When if you think of the mistakes, the errors, the failures that have been made, just go for the last fortnight or the last month, fortnight's two weeks, sorry, 
And what are all the mistakes and errors that have happened or, or the big failures? And then there's some work in there in identifying what kind of failure it is. So she brings to us basic, complex and intelligent failures. The ones that we're excited about are intelligent failures. And the intelligent failures have sort of three different things to them. They're well planned, well thought out. There's there's some preparation gone into there. They cause no harm or very little harm. And we can learn. And here's the big part. This is this culture of learning. And if we're going to upskill, reskill, transform continually, we're going to be learning. So there's your intelligent failure. And then as you look at the mistakes, the errors, the failures that have happened, they happen for a number of reasons. So the ones that are truly blameworthy are the ones that literally they're sabotage. Like, did anybody wake up and decide to try and sabotage the company today? If they did, okay, blame. You can point at that point, you can point the finger and you can come down heavy. But as the continuum moves across and we get into things, I think the next one off sabotage is inattention. And then we've got things like challenge, uncertainty, experimentation. It shifts towards actually, there's your praiseworthy. That's what we mean about celebration. So if we ran an experiment, let's say, and our language around experiment is getting better too, then, and it doesn't work, but it's actually praiseworthy because we've learned from it. And then the next obvious conversation from there is, how are we sharing that learning? How is that surfacing? Yeah, that's so good. I like, you know, you, you often bring up this topic of this idea of that vast majority of people in at work are getting up and going work to actually do something good, to be productive. Yeah. Yeah. Very few, very few wake up and make the choice to, uh, you know, engage in chaos and sabotage. There's some, there are some. I haven't met them yet, Craig. I haven't yeah. met them. <laughs> but, um, but the, the, this whole concept of that, that we want to do well, what you said there, I think the one that probably triggers and I'm making an assumption here that probably triggers more leaders than not is the intent of error. I think that's what you called it or the intent of failure. Right. And so it is the, uh, come on, you should have known better than that failure. Right. But, but I think that, go ahead. Okay. So this happened to me and you know about it two weeks ago, pretty much. And it was on a Monday morning. Yep. And it was the thing that happened was a hundred percent my fault. And it was down to inattention, it was down to going too quick. I made the error. And here's the deal. And then by by nature of who it happened with, it I never received any pointed fingers or what I received a lot of the minute I said, Oh God, this is all my fault, <laughs> was a lot of Jenny, uh, you're human. And actually when I ended up offering the the most serious apology and sincere apology that was required in that situation there was a gentleman in the room that just said you know I'm proud and honored to be here on the day that you showed me you were human and <laughs> and this is but but back to your point most people wake up and come to do a good job and we're human and we're fallible and it's that fallible piece it's gross and I you know, just talking about it, I've got all the hairs up on the back of my neck. Like it is not nice to get it wrong, but we do. And what do we do in that situation? Because if we're learning new ways, if we're building new processes, if we're learning new technologies, this is going to happen. And we have to own our fallibility and we have to get used to talking about it. Um yeah. Yeah, it, it's tough, but yeah, that one was a hundred percent inattention. Yeah, and, and like I say, it happens, and I think that's probably the one that drives projecting my feeling, right? It's the one that drives me nuts. Right? Yeah, but um, I think as a leader, you really need to be careful and really watch your language, your reaction around it. Hundred percent. Once is okay, right? Yeah. Same error two, three, four times. That starts to become a pattern that you need to have as we've talked about many times, you need to have a conversation about. There's your performance conversation. Yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things that we've talked about so many times, and maybe we can kind of de go down this rabbit hole a little bit, um, is that conversations matter. Yes. Everything that we do every day 
everything that a leader does every day is built around conversations. And how do you have good, productive, um, engaging conversations mm-hmm. with your mm-hmm. team? I don't know if we're just thinking and looking ahead to next year, you know, kind of what are your thoughts around what tips can we provide folks here about having better conversations? So, and then we can do a look back, look forwards too, because, sure. and I'm struggling to remember the month, but I feel like it was maybe in February, I might have that wrong. Um, we had a conversation on, I think we called it assertive leadership. So those of yep. you scanning the podcast or the state channel there, you'll find it. And there's lots in there. So looking forward to next year, how do we make those conversations? Like Conversations are worthy, really, when you think about it. If I asked you, Craig, you know, what are you paid to do? You would you would give me your job description, kind of verbal. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'd then, give you the results. I'm <laughs> you would probably give me numbers. Yes, yes, yes. And and when I say to you, okay, so how do you get to those numbers? Everything that you do is built on conversation. Look at us here and now. This entire um, product, well, I don't know what to call it, webinar series, is based on conversation. And so really, if you hold that title of leader, but even a lot of people who step into leadership in an individual contributor role, you're paid to have conversation every day. And so the more value we can put to those conversations, the better. So if I'm trying to narrow my focus, what would make our conversations better? The first thing is your relationship. So where does where does the trust with that person sit? And that in itself is a big conversation. But paying attention to trust isn't just how I look at you. Trust is also how you assess me. And so we've got that two-way part within this. So one, build the relationships. Secondly, remember that there's two people in the conversation. And so often when I'm with a group, we'll play literally a game of catch. That's a great conversation where the ball goes backwards and forwards. There's a rhythm and a cadence to it. And that brings us to that sort of voice share part. Who's doing the talking? And there's that wonderful acronym, Louise Evans uses it in her TED talk, WAIT. And her WAIT is, what am I telling myself? Okay, so if we're trying to preempt what the other person is saying or if we're predicting it or we're just looking for that moment where we can catch them, not very helpful. But the other WAIT is, why am I talking? And for leaders, that's a really important one because the person that you're in conversation with, especially if they report to you, it's their job it's probably their issue and their problem or their celebration and you're doing all the talking so we need to do a lot more stop talking i think and yeah. paying attention yeah well, and i think evan that we've chatted with throughout the over the year sometime during this year you yeah. know his comment around you know when you're in that conversation look for the next question to ask brilliant yeah right yeah. yeah and it, it, his, his his comment very much is as you're looking to find the next question to ask, you often find that it gets answered before you get to ask it. Yeah. So you always have to be listening and looking forward to find the next question to ask your team member, which I think is just a such an interesting approach. And I think we're, you know, we're all human. And I think where this falls down or fails sometimes is that, you know, to your point around voice share, et cetera, is that you know, I've got something I want to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got something you want to say, right? And so as opposed to wait, waiting for the uh, uh, the break in the conversation to ask the next question, you're waiting for the break in the conversation to say what you wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh. It's it, it, the intentionality that you, I think that people that do this really well, it, it's, it's challenging to start with to change your habit and become intentional about having a great conversation. How often do you walk into a conversation every day at work, thinking about how am I going to make this a good conversation? Mm. Right? Are you running from one meeting to another or clicking from one Zoom meeting to another and then just reacting to what transpires in front of you as opposed to, you know, taking a pause and thinking about, okay, here's what I want to accomplish in here. Here's the goal. Here's how I'm going to listen. Here's how I'm going to show up. It's tough. It is. And I, I think you just mentioned something great there too, in that take the pause So we often talk about, you know, control the controllables and you're in control of when you click to join a meeting. You're in control of when you walk 
into the room. So if you need to pause and, and really what 10 to 30 seconds is probably enough. If you can just pour, like take a good deep breath. What is the energy that I need in here? Uh, I arrive sometimes with a bundle of energy. That's too much for people. I have to bring that back again. Like, you know, know your audience. Who are you talking to? Yeah. Dial it up, dial it down. Do you need to do you need to lose something from the last conversation? Just park it. It'll still be there when this conversation is finished, but it allows us to be present. And with our lives being so busy and and that's not just our work life, that's our home life as well and everything else. Just that pause can be really, really healthy for people and allow us just to to be present and to pay attention. And that when we get to there, you know, coming back to you again, we're learning so much and those conversations are better. And when conversations are better, we're able to elevate higher. Um, it's interesting, you, your comment about uh, having the conversations at home too. Right? Mm. How often do you... How often do you have a different approach in the office than you do at home? And do you approach one of them better than you do in the other one? I think it's just an interesting thing to think yeah. about, right? You come home, you probably let your guard down. You're less um, intentional, perhaps less thoughtful about it all because, well, these are the people that see you every day, right? Yeah, we, we talk about <laughs> this a lot in emotional intelligence. And again Craig to your point we're all human so we will not be perfect we won't get this right we also have different personas that we take like that there's basically three and your everyday persona that's the one that you choose to take to work with you your underlying one is all the filters are off it's reserved for a very special few that's probably in most cases your family close friends and then there's the overextended one, which is just a whole different ball game as well. And at the end of the day, we are the same person, whether we're at home or we're at work. So if you're one of those people that does it differently, my first question always is, how's that working for you? And, and so in one case, if you're pretending or faking it to be something that you're not, that's a lot of energy being put into trying to hold something that's not naturally you. So how can we get them closer to balance? But the one that's really concerning to me is when you're at work and you're trying to maintain this the whole time. And so what tends to happen is we hold back any emotional expression. We stuff it in. We don't make that connection. We just hold it together. Nobody will ever know. And the problem with that often is that when that person gets home, it is one tiny thing. And all of a sudden, the emotional intensity doesn't match the situation. And you're losing it at somebody that you love. That's not a great equation. And that's one that I think needs that balance in there. So we, we could all make our holidays maybe a little bit better by thinking of that over the next couple of weeks. <laughs> well, and we've talked about the, uh, you, know, you know, does emotion belong at work or not at work? Like we kind of built that around emotional intelligence. But I think this is going way back, perhaps earlier than than this year. But yet, to your point, the leader that is always just there, mm. right? And, you know, I think, I think you're trying to avoid, you don't want the leader that's going to have the emotional angry outburst. But occasionally, you know, individuals need to, or leaders need to remember that the emotion that you show to your team can also show that you give a damn. Oh, 100%. Fair, right? And if you're just constantly here without showing positive or negative emotion, um, it, sometimes it just it just shows that you don't you don't care. And like, it's like working for a brick wall. Like, yeah. <laughs> I may as well turn and talk to the wall. And and the other key in there, two things that you said that were really really good there is one, um, if you don't show anything, I don't know. So if you don't yeah. tell me that you're frustrated. I don't know. It's just it's just information. And and I can't connect if I don't know. And the other thing, and I think this is huge, is our brains, our brains are actually a little bit simple. That's that doesn't sound right, but you can't Especially stop <laughs> it's December the 15th. I'll give you that today only. But you can't stuff the unpleasant emotions 
by themselves. So if you're stuffing right. unpleasant and not showing it, you're stuffing pleasant and not showing it. And that means we're also not saying, you know, I'm really proud of the work that you've done. How often does that sentence come out? And, you know, back to the home and the workplace, like, how hard is it for some people to actually look their child in the eye and say, I'm, I'm really proud of what you've done this term, this semester, these couple of weeks. Same in both places. And we're human. That validation, that acknowledgement. And we talked about this recently, too. That's a positive touch, not a physical touch necessarily. That's a positive touch. And those are, oh, what was it, 30 times more powerful then even if you're being constructive in the, yeah, you didn't do so well here. So the, this is really important for success. Um, shifting gears a little bit, because I caught a mm -hmm. great comment in the chat here from Kay around um, essentially the message that was presented to their group was do better. And I, I, I won't, I won't read it all, but it, it triggered a thought for me around one of the things that we are looking ahead to in 2024 is you know leaders are being asked to do more with less to do more to do better right yeah. to speed up innovate more um you know Kay's question in here is how can you essentially ask your team for more ask for better something better without just simply saying do better sort of thing but i think we can kind of wrap this all into you know the next topic around how do we do more speed up, innovate, what do leaders need to think about? So we just put it all into chat GPT and say, there, it's done. <laughs> chat GPT, please, can you do my job for me? Um, <laughs> it's this is actually, this is interesting. Uh, there's a couple of things I, I scan read. I can't read them as quick as you, uh, Craig, uh, Kay's comment. And notice the language. The language is the trigger. And so what we sort of the old way legacy conversations are you know prove yourself and companies are set up to leaders are set up to tell their people and that doesn't feel good we feel like we're being parented back to what we were saying earlier today you know every single one of us the hundreds of you on this call we show up at work because basically we vote for that organization with our lives that is a lot of hours going into that organization we are adults with a skill set yeah we're having to change a few of them now but we show up wanting to do a good job and so when we feel parented do better yeah there's a point of finger in there it's not a wonder that results in that reaction and so for leaders you know, one, really consider your language that you're using and how is that coming across? And then to your point for leaders that are being asked to do more with less speed up and all the rest of it, I think one of the biggest conversations to skill set I have to lean into myself in 2024 is how do we do that dance with AI, GAI, whatever else it is that's that's on our doorstep and coming? Because it's not going away. I don't actually think we want it to go away. We have to figure that piece out. And then I think organizations really need to help their leaders. Because if you keep going down that road of do more with less, deal with the expectations, deal with the people problems, but you have your leaders in execution mode who are doing a full on day job and the leadership bit is tacked on the side, that is a recipe for, actually, it's a recipe for people to crash in terms of health. And if we don't have leader well-being, we can't, we can't, nobody can do better. Nothing will be better. And so it's really how do we persuade organizations to pause and take a look at what are they actually asking of their people? And is that realistic? That's a tall order, but it's one worth aspiring to, I think. Yeah. And it becomes a really interesting conversation where um you as a leader have a certain view of what's realistic and the leaders above you have a different yeah. view of either what's realistic or what they believe should be uh, realistic or what's even worse is if you don't even know if they think it's realistic but they just think it's what we have to have that's worst case scenario absolutely right? yeah yeah um but it, it is it's a challenge and you know i've seen it happen before 
where a leader says, okay, yeah, you know what? We probably could do it again next year. We could probably deliver a little bit more next year with what we had this year, just a little bit less. But if I go ahead and do that and deliver it, what am I going to be asked for the next year and the year after that? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? If you, you can't, you can't keep overperforming year after year. Maybe you no. can, I don't know. It's, it's the uh, concept of, you know, what is high performance and how long can you maintain high performance? But the challenge with leaders is then how do you rally your team around a cause or how do you rally them to buy into here's what we at least need to try to accomplish. Right? And, and I maybe think you're, that- maybe you're changing the bar and you as the leader are taking on, whether you're going to cross that other bar. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not making sense here, but. Yeah, you are. I, I think that I think the key in there is like, and we we've said this. This is cool. We're looking back. What is performance? Like, what will that look like for our team? There's the boundaries that we mentioned. These conversations aren't happening. You can't build a high performing team in a week, and you can't build a high performing team in a month. One of the characteristics of a high performing team is that they have been together for a long time. And in that long time, they have built trust, they've built social capital, they're still building those, those, you know, go up and down with time. And they've defined what success looks like, what failure looks like. They built the culture of reciprocity, they've built the culture of learning, and all of that takes time. And so, you know, can you can you constantly build? I think that you can. But I think that's a very intentional journey. And and here's one of the places where we don't help ourselves with all the change and we keep moving people around and shifting this and shifting that. And so we're never set up for success to build a high performing team. And again, I think going going back a little bit, I was had the pleasure of listening to an executive member from one of the organizations downtown and, and they said out loud, we have realized it's not realistic what we're looking at for 2024. We're taking a look at that right now. Now, if so, you know, there it is. It can be said and it can be a great conversation at that, that top level. Yeah, you, you don't hear that very often. No, so not I, at all. Or at least I haven't heard those. Or maybe those stories just don't get out. True, true that. How often, yeah. how often do executives want to admit that they've, made a mistake perhaps. And there's a problem in leadership, right? Is how, how many leaders are uh, just simply afraid? Yeah, I got it wrong. We're we're right back. Yeah. We're right back to that failure piece. Yeah. And if you're not, if you're not saying it, then you're perfect. And there's no way that I'm going to tell you because I don't want to admit imperfection if you're so busy being perfect. Um, you said something in there about, you know, defining performance, defining failure, Just any thoughts, tips for leaders on the call today? Like, how, how do you do that? Like, practically, how do you decide with your team, we're going to define performance? <laughs> so performance is made up of a whole number of pieces of pie, if you like. And like pie. pardon me, you like pie? Yeah, excellent. I like pie. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> Um, but so the, there's a number of different elements to performance. So as a leader, understanding what the performance is in and, and the key in that conversation is the how. So I would start, I think, with let's define what success looks like. And then how are we going to get to that success? What are the key, let's call it, Uh, behaviors it's easy to understand what are the key behaviors that if we carry these out we will get to that success now we have to walk within that understanding that our realities are we've used this acronym before they're paid realities so we're under pressure we're always on there is an information overload and we're going to be distracted so now what we get into the conversation of is the habits that we need to build around those behaviors that will set us up for success. And when we focus in on those kind of conversations, the how we do the work and that how we do the work, you can't have that conversation on January the 2nd 
and then park it and leave it be and say, check the box, done. We'll meet again December the 15th next year. This is a continual conversation because we're constantly shifting. You know, everybody who had that conversation in January 2020 wasn't having the same conversation in April 2020. So we have to keep having the conversation and working with what's in what are the conditions what are the conditions that we're facing as a leader you have a key fundamental part in building the environment for performance the conditions are set so sometimes we have to change in order to meet the conditions i'm not sure that made sense but there's some elements in there it, no it, it certainly does i think is is def, is the definition of success hitting the goal or is the is the definition of success defining the behaviors and systems, et cetera, that should lead to the goal? Right. Yeah, I would. Do you, you know what I'm saying here? Is right because uh -huh. if it's just all about hitting the goal, you know, you can create some behaviors too that could. Hundred percent. It's about hitting the number. You can. Whatever yeah. it might be. So. I'm always going to lean to stick with the performance. You will get results. If you concentrate on the performance, the results will come. That's really difficult when the layer above you or two layers above you is shoving results this way. And it's a, it's almost a trust and a, a faith in building that how-to. And to your point, we buy in, we're engaged when we enjoy the process. We don't show up daily and some industries do some some jobs do but there's very few who show up to actually get a number each day we 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 show up to be in great conversation in our world like a good day for me is the conversations that i've had yeah. and actually you know when we look back the year that we've had 1700 leaders or so i have had some great conversations and that performance builds the knock-on results, but the focus is on what are we doing every day? And and we we engage, we're more satisfied when it aligns with our values. And I don't see many people, here we are again, show up at work with the value of, I'd really like to be dishonest and just kind of take the shortcut and get it wrong today. Like, <laughs> there's, there's got to be somebody out there, but I, I haven't met them yet. Well, that's fair. Um... Speaking of today and time, this is a bad segue, but it's the best I could do. Um, leaders just don't seem to have enough time mm -hmm. to get done everything that they're being asked to get done. Yep. I'm not necessarily sure if that's going to get better or worse. Oh, about you, but for me, every year it feels like you know I've got to try and cram more into every day, every week, etc. Thoughts. Uh, if I had not enough time. Yeah, if I had a dollar for everyone who said to me, I just don't have enough time. This leadership thing takes time. It, yes. So the first the first step always is what are you spending your time doing? We are creatures of habit. And somewhere we had a conversation on delegation and priorities. I think it was actually close to the beginning of this year. And we use James Clear's quote. I think it was as our big idea as well, actually. And that quote is, is one of the most annoying quotes I have in my arsenal, actually. But, you know, every action that you take is a vote for the kind of person you wish to become. So when you show up in that meeting with three other colleagues from your team, so now we're paying four people to be in the same conversation and you're sat there trying to deal with something on your phone and not engaging, what you're actually saying is, I am the kind of person that wastes my time going to meetings that aren't important. <laughs> and when we look at it that way, that hurts just a little bit, because again, that's not really our intention, is it? It's like, oh, I've been invited. I should be crucial to this conversation. So every time that comes up in conversation, two big questions. One, what's going on in your calendar? And sometimes even leaders need some help with this. Like what can go? And, and the easiest ones are if you're optional on the meeting invite, someone's being nice, you don't need to go to that meeting. Like we're very kind to people and we I say, okay, it's coming, but I'm going to invite Jenny because I don't want her to feel left out. 
If you're optional, you don't need to go. You can ask for the minutes. You're on the meeting, but you don't need to go. And then the second one is, are you crucial to the conversation? If you look at the agenda or look at the purpose of the meeting and you're like, yes, I have something to offer or my team needs to hear and understand this. All right. Probably a decent use of your time. And then the third one, as we mentioned, is how many of you are going. And so looking at your calendar and then tie that very closely to the conversation of what's the priority. And we've laughed about this a number of times, but priority is single. And yep. so we're told nowadays we can probably handle two or three, but a list of 10 out to lunch. And the problem with going beyond three is that those are now all distractions. Because if you give me 10 priorities and I'm looking at them, chances are six and seven are the ones that I like to do the most. And there goes my time into that. Well, that's not going for our one, two or three priority. And in that conversation of yours, what is performance? It's got to be focusing on one, two and three that will get us to where we want to be. Yeah, no, it's so good. And I, I think too, as a leader, your comment around priority for me was great. And I think when you were speaking with your team, mm -hmm. you have to be able to help them remember what those priorities oh, are. Right. And you have to ensure that you are doing your damnedest to clear out all the other stuff yep. or making it okay to ignore the other stuff or stop doing the other stuff that inhibits the top one, two, three things being done. And you have to be comfortable having the same conversation upwards. We're yes. all going to be in situations where your leader has a priority that isn't on your list. And then all of a sudden it gets pushed onto your list because it's gone up their list. Yes. Right? That's going to happen. So how do you juggle? How do you work that out? Um, I think practically too, you know, for me, this has always been a huge benefit time blocking and go in now folks and start looking out January, February, maybe January is not the right way. Feb, March, April, May block your calendar. Mm -hmm. time in your calendar that you've made an appointment with yourself, right? We are so, you things default so easily in, in Outlook. If somebody looks and you don't have a time slot available, well, they probably don't book the meeting, right? And uh, just time, like taking control of your own calendar and blocking it, using, um, using your to-do list, schedule it in your calendar as opposed to having it sitting down the side of Outlook, actually put it in the Outlook calendar. Right? And so I think there's there's ways that leaders can be um, selfishly productive with their time. You also need to make sure, though, you can be more selfishly productive as an individual contributor of your calendar. As a leader, you do need to be available to your team. Yes. So how do you how do you schedule that in as well? How do you schedule available time in? Uh, I think are all things that that you need to consider in this as well. We had somewhere in the year, and I forget which one it was in, might have been the assertive one, I'm not sure. Um, John Amici talks about pit time, and pit time is purposefully interruptible time. So mm. that's another good block in your calendar. And if you are somebody that focuses in the morning, don't put your pit time in the morning, <laughs> put it in the afternoon, because that's when you're going to get interrupted, purposefully interruptible time. It's the time I know, even if we're working remotely, I can actually just call you. And we've stopped doing that. And so it doesn't have to be a team's message. We don't do very well at deciphering each other's written text. We can't understand the context that it comes in. But we can pick up the phone if we know that it's safe, if it's good time to do that, and just grab the quick question and the quick answer. And as long as you set the boundaries, set the stage, the parameters, that could work really well for people. Uh, speaking of setting boundaries, we set one to end at a fairly reasonable time for everybody to get oh. to their 9 a.m.s. And we're running up against that boundary now, Jenny. That was a, that was a much better segue. <laughs> that was good. One. That yeah. was really good. I wasn't expecting one. And yeah. I didn't realize it was that time either. That's kind oh, of cool. I know, you know. It's like, you know, I have one last one left in me here this year. So <laughs> All right. So as we come towards a close, typically 
on the at the end of our sessions we will offer one big idea two applied strategies and three questions to get us going today once we've left this slide i'll we'll start there we're just going to have a big idea we've had lots of strategies in our conversation there's a few strategies wrapped in my big idea you'll see it in a moment and for those listening on our podcast version uh, i will be talking to what we're showing on our screen here in the live version as well I popped this in as a little extra. I quite like this quote from Erica Farmer, but what a thing to aspire to. That's really, really difficult. But I think for 2024, let's be aware of the tension. We have tensions all over the place in leadership, but recognize that actually dancing is far more fun than a tug of war. So let's dance within the feedback, figure out how to fail more intelligently, and we'll continue to be working to help people lead with a better clarity. That is a fun way to go as opposed to the, the toughness within the tension. So our big idea today comes to you in the form of three words and a gift-inspired holiday season. And the first one for big is believe. Where do you need more belief? What can you do to show that you believe in your people. We talked about that, telling people you're proud of the work they've done, acknowledge um, the accomplishments in the year. And this doesn't stop at the end of December. This is a great part to take in because if you show your team you believe in them, they can grow uh, far faster than if they're getting nothing. I is inspire, but we're going to take that. We talked about this a little bit To How are you creating the environment and you are crucial as a leader in that environment whether you're stepping into leadership or whether you're a leader with a role how's the purpose coming what's your energy you are contagious take that with you every day and know that your people will be growing from that one too and then gifts we didn't talk about this so much today but we have a lot for people looking back in our 2023 series this is so important are we recognizing the strengths, our own strengths and the people around us and talking about them and using them? It might even lead to a couple of tasks being switched so that people can work within their strengths. And that truly, if you can have people working there as a gift to them, they're going to love the work that they do. And it will be a gift to you in return as well. So one big idea comes in three forms, believe, inspire, and what are the gifts within your team? It would be very rude for me, though, not to finish with what is supposed to be three questions. Uh, Craig often rolls his eyes at this point, because as you can see there, there's way more than three questions. But if you need a contemplation, a thought as you enter into the last couple of weeks of December or looking forward to 2024, which is a really, really good moment to take. What do you need? You. What do you need? for 2024, uh, these might help you on the next uh, next couple of days or heading into 2024. So almost three, I make no promises for next year, Craig. We might just have to put questions at the end and we'll see where we go. Be a good idea. There you go. Perfect, thank you once again, Jenny, and everybody that's uh, joined us throughout the year. And uh, if today was your first time, obviously thank you as well. Um, as always, Jenny, I appreciate you and folks have yourselves, uh, the best of the holiday season. Enjoy, uh, I don't know if you're like me planning on eating too much, drinking too much, sleeping too much, <laughs> it's like the perfect holiday trifecta. So, uh, with that, have a great day, a great weekend and take care everybody. Bye for now. Excellent. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you, Craig.